It's awesome to have on the health and wellness interview call today, Mr. Jed Robinson. Hey, Jed. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You're welcome, Jed. Just talking before we went live, Jed's multifaceted professional trainer, ex rugby union professional athlete. He runs a, a food truck, and um, Jed does a lot of work with uh, the rugby union and drug free sport here at NZ, which is awesome to hear. So, thanks so much for your time today, Jed. Hey, Jay, what's your take on this wellness thing that's going around? Obviously, you're obviously your personal trainer. Mm. It's around a lot. It, it, it's kind of in vogue, you know, the wellness thing. What's your take on that? Yeah, it's interesting, eh? Like, um, what is wellness? Like, mm. is being well wellness? Um, um, yeah, and I've done a little bit of reading into this and, and what is health and wellness. And really, if, if you look at the positive psychology type of things, it's probably more around people flourishing. So flourishing doesn't mean um, that you're happy all the time, but flourishing means um, that you're doing things with purpose. You know, you know where you're going. Um, you're ha generally happy with where you're going and what you want to do. Um, and you've got some good strategies if you start going away from that to bring you back to, to flourishing again. Um, but yeah, it is, it is a vogue word at the moment. Um, and I think at some stage it will get burnt out if it hasn't already. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Flourish, as in sort of like a, a floral metaphor that, you know, you, you may be in the sunlight or nutrients and water and, you know, you, you're trying to accelerate that sense of growth. Is, would that be relevant to you? Yeah, it's interesting. So it's, it's a guy called Martin Seligman. So um, he's a positive psychology guru, if you know much into him. So he's, it's actually a book he's written called Flourish. So um, he started with like learned optimism. So how to be positive and then failed. I think he found that if you just tell people to be positive or if they're just positive, that doesn't mean they're actually going to be happy. But so it's kind of the next step around flourishing. So um, he's kind of got five areas. If I can remember them, it's around a PERMA model. So, um, so having positive relationships is like the number one key. So if you um, have positive relationships, so obviously with your friends, your family, um, generally you're going to be happier and healthier because you've got positive relationships. And as you can imagine, when people aren't feeling good, that's when they pull away from relationships. So I don't want to talk to my friends. I'm going to sit at home and be quiet in a room and play PlayStation with my hoodie on. And I'm going to, going to get away from that. Um, finding flow. So what some things you do in your life that um, make you find flow so you can just kind of get lost in it. Um, what's a, um, a Having an accomplishment. Um, I forget the other two off the, have it off the top of my head, but basically, yeah, it's five kind of areas around. If you're having, if you those five areas are doing well, you're generally flourishing in life. So you're happy and healthy and, and going somewhere where you want to go. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah. So you're not avoiding your hit class with Jed Robinson. You're, you're getting straight. <laughs> well, as as we know, for most people, almost everyone we know, if exercise is a big part of making people feel healthier um, or happier and feeling better. Um, we all know the endorphin kick and all the positive side that goes in your body. We also do know that the body and mind isn't, they're not segregated. So if you work the body, you're generally helping your mind feel better and vice versa. So um, we all know that, yeah, exercises probably and sleep and nutrition are kind of a big part of that area. Yeah. So if I came to you, Jed, and, and wanted to get into this whole wellness game, mm -hmm. just being a personal trainer and a, and a specialist and an expert, where mm -hmm. would you start with me? If I just wanted to make a start, what would you do? Yeah, it's interesting. So that PUMA model is probably something I've been doing more with people. So there's actually a um, kind of a questionnaire you can fill out, and it kind of ranks those areas for you. So I've, I've started looking at that in terms of, so how, what does their whole life look like? And then I and then I'll look into so what does exercise look like to you and what's some triggers that help you exercise and eat healthy and, and take you towards feeling good and what's some triggers that take you away from it. So those are kind of the two areas I look at. So if I know that you're um, you know, you and I'm not a psychologist, but I know if you've got really poor relationships, you're not talking to anyone in your family, um, you've got no friends or you've had arguments with them all and you're just at home by yourself, that generally you're probably going to struggle to want to exercise and, and do and eat well and, and look after yourself. Yeah. So then I can say, well, hey, got, look at this answers. If we can try and reconnect you with your family and, and get you feeling happier about life, you're probably going to exercise better. Um, but 
with all of it, it's small little goals to start with. So if it's really like Chris, yep, you haven't exercised for two years, you want to get back into it. As you can imagine, what always happens with everyone, they have a um, a lot of motivation at the start, and, you've, and they'll want to train 10 times a week for the first three weeks because they're into it, and then they get to the end of three weeks and they're like, I can't do this anymore. It's too hard. And it's like, well, you've just tried to fire in. Yeah, so the big up and down, the peaks and the troughs. Um, so I've got to kind of hold you back and say, hey, look, let's just get you in three times a week for 30 minutes for the next six weeks, and let's make it something that you can sustain for two years instead of you be here for three weeks and I don't see you again. Yeah. Um, and that's probably the big things I've learned. I've got to try and hold, hold you back just so I can get you to stay past that, that trough, that peak and trough period. Yeah. Well, maybe come on to motivation a little bit later on. Obviously, mm. COVID lockdown here in New Zealand, where is it, day, I don't know, well, we're in level three now. So yeah. it's five weeks. Yeah. And we, we talked, talked a little bit before we went on, camp, on on live here about the the transition and the changes coming into lockdown. Mm. And uh, obviously, be training with you online and the team, uh, mm. doing hit classes has been amazing. What, what's been your sort of co your COVID lockdown journey in a, in a yeah. summated form, Jed? For me, it's been peaks and troughs, no question. Like, I've, I've had some, um, like, obviously, when we first came in, it sounds funny, but I was almost a little bit excited. Like, I was almost a little bit like, in, in my situation, yeah, I don't have to, um, as we talked about, uh, our family situation means that money isn't a concern. So I don't have, even though we're all in the same storm, my boat's probably a little bit different to some others. Yeah. Um, I was a little bit excited to see, all right, I'm going to be stay at home, Dan, for the next bit. Um, kind of bring it on. Like, let's see see what I can do and how can I um, get through that. And it's probably like that motivation thing that I just talked about. The first couple of weeks, I was like, I was hammering it. I was having all these little games for the kids. I was all over it. And then I had a flat patch about two weeks in um, and was a little bit like, oh, man, I, I'm only halfway into this. Like, this is, I, I don't know when the ending is. Um, and then when they obviously had the announcement, um, I was probably hoping level three was going to be a bit more of different than level four to me. Um, and that probably hit me for six a little bit. Um, took me a day or two to go, okay, it's just, for me, it's still level four in my head. I've got to do that for the next couple of weeks. And all, the, all along those periods, I probably had a couple of days where I got flat. Um, but like we said before, I went back to my triggers. So made it really important that those days when I felt a bit flat, I looked at what could help me or make me feel better. So I made sure I exercised those days. Um, I love reading books. So at night, did a bit of reading on something that fascinated me. Um, and the other thing I like if I have time is to watch some movie and kind of take myself away. So kind of made a, made a conscious effort when I was feeling a bit flat to do some of those things um, just to make me feel a little bit better. But it, it's definitely been a bit of an up and down um, feeling and I, I'm probably now hoping that it's getting towards the end and because I know the end isn't too far away time's starting to slow down a little bit if that makes sense yeah yeah um, and it's interesting how your mindset kind of psychology starts playing the game because if you told me it was we had another six months of it, it would be okay I'm here for six months but another mm -hmm. 10 days or so feels like a long time at the moment yeah yeah Mm. Yeah, that's, we, yeah, we've got similar domestic situation. We've got professional wives, and you know mm. we're really, really fortunate, and yeah, and maybe boxed above our weight a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, I mean, even the, in this lockdown, when it comes to procrastination and folk get letting their analysis mind getting on board with, oh, I'll do the session at nine with Jed, and then it's sort mm. of ten to nine five. Have you got any tips from your travels in sport and rugby to? to crack procrastination if those viewing here are saying they're going to exercise but they're yeah. finding excuses um probably the more it's just structure for me so if i look at my diary and go oh i'm going to work out tomorrow if i just say i'm going to work out tomorrow it's easy for me to go uh it's nine o'clock I'll, I'll do it in an hour and you kind of procrastinate it and push it out so um probably the big things is is trying to trick yourself so if i have my diary i actually block it into the diary so it's nine o'clock, I set an alarm, so it's training time. So um, just trying to put cues and barriers, good barriers in the way to go, this is what I'm doing. Um, and then it gets to that time, and right, I'm up and ready to go. The other thing that I've started doing is, especially if I know I'm gonna exercise in the morning, when I get up, I put my exercise clothes on straight away. Um, so not sit in my pajamas or 
put some other clothes on and then know I have to get cha cha changed again. And it sounds funny, but it's just lots of little triggers. So then I'm triggering my mind to go, oh, yeah, my exercise gear's on. That means I'm going to work out soon. Um, and then, but I suppose for me, there is, it is easier knowing for me that if you know that my class is on, I, I've actually got an appointment. It's my job. So four times a week I'm, or three or four times a week I'm doing that. Um, I'm lucky to say this is, I have to do it. Otherwise I'm letting other people down. But um, I still think, yeah, like for yourself, if you told me, if you sent me a text the night before and said, hey, I'm going to be at your class, I'll front you in the class, say, Chris, you, where are you, mate? So lots of little things you can use people to help you. It doesn't have to be a personal trainer, but little triggers like that could help you kind of stay, stay on with what you're doing. And that doesn't have to actually just be exercise. That could be saying you're going to do two hours of work from 10 to 12. So um, telling your wife that you're going to work from 10 to 12 so they can, she can tell you, hey, do yeah. your room. Um, yeah. But yeah, as we know at home, there's, there's other things. If you've got kids or pets or whatever that's going to take you away, some external triggers that could affect you, you've got to take that into consideration as well. One thing I've found is just parking your conscious mind a little bit. So I think it was last Wednesday on your, your class. I was going into analysis mode, like nine minutes to nine. Yeah. And I just started walking upstairs. I just said, uh, uh, just, just stop analyzing, walk upstairs, sneakers, t you know, singlet. And I did the class. Yeah, nice. I think it's just for me, it's parking the analysis. And, uh, cause if you go to analysis, you, you, the excuses, we're great at excuse making machines, aren't we? Yeah. I call it the devil and angel. I think you've probably heard it. That. So we have our angel. That's obviously when we're feeling good, you know, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll do that. And then it's when the times are tough, that devil starts kind of sliding up and just, you know, oh, oh I'm a bit sorted. I'm a bit tired. Oh, and you just start kind of letting that get bigger and bigger. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you're right. It's just kind of go, no, no, just park it. What am I going to do? Yeah. yeah. So, Jed, who are your key influences growing up, getting into rugby, obviously professional athlete? Who did you look up to? in your sort of teens, maybe early twenties that were role models perhaps to, to yeah. get to the, I mean, it's all health and fitness, the rugby industry. Yeah. But, mm. Interesting question. So for me, it was um, like, so um, as you probably know, I lost my dad when I was quite young. So um, my dad had a heart attack when he, when I was four years old. So, and I was the youngest of five kids. So when I was growing up, it was interesting. Um, when I reflect back on a lot of that stuff, so probably my oldest brother, who was 10 years older than me, um, had a lot of influence on um, kind of my childhood and what I was doing. And luckily, um, being part of a big family, having a couple of brothers, we spent a lot of time playing backyard cricket and table tennis. And we were lucky enough, we had a yeah, little rumpus room down the bottom. So we had darts and all sorts of stuff. And we were, there was a lot of competition going between us. Um, so probably early on into my mid-teens, probably my older brother was the one I looked up to and the one that was following his lead about playing cricket and playing rugby and, and that type of thing. And then he did his, he left when I was about 15 to do his big OE over to England, as, as most Kiwis do. Um, and then just by chance, I ended up with a, a cricket coach, a guy called Mark Borthwick. So anyone in Wellington will know him, just a... He was from Wellington College, but he was one of my rep coaches and um, South African man, grew up in the army in South Africa, brilliant man, could love a chat, a great motivational speaker, and for some weird reason, just resonated with me um, and got the best out of me. Um, and I was a difficult teenager, probably, um, wouldn't say I was bad, but I would speak my mind and get myself in a bit of trouble. and. Um, had a, a huge sense of fairness, but probably took it a little bit too far. And yeah. um, he just kind of took me under his under his wing and kind of drove me for the, probably the next three or four years, especially in cricket. But I took a lot of what I learned from him into my rugby. Um, and he was probably my mentor through my teens, which looking back was really, really important. Um, obviously not having a kind of father figure around, but a mum who was really supportive. Um, and loved to cricket and would drive me everywhere and take me everywhere. Probably looking back, those three in combination um, were the, the major influences on me through that period, which was really, really important. Um, and then as I got older, um, yeah, obviously getting into the academy system and, and rep systems, you have a lot of quality, 
quality coaches and people there that are helping you. And then Chris Boyd, um, who was the Hurricanes coach um, at that stage, was uh, Wellington ITM coach, you know, NPC coach back then and was part of the academy and was a Wellingtonian, um, probably helped me the most, gave me a lot of confidence about who I was and what I was trying to do and to kind of keep going, even though it was tough. And um, yeah, until I was 23 or 24 and then kind of emerged through into the sports stuff. So I was lucky looking back, had a lot of key people that um, at, at certain times when I needed it kind of pushed me through those gaps where I could have easily fallen through and, and given up. Yeah. Mm. And I have to ask you about a certain Irishman, Mr. Keith Wood. Yeah, yeah. So um, in terms of rugby, looking at, looking back, Keith Wood and Kevin Mialamu were probably um, no question the two kind of people that I looked up to how, how they played the game. Um, loved, I was a big fan of ball, like the ball carry and how they carried. And just at that stage, their, how they played the game was different to a traditional hooker. Um, and I just love the Irish. I love, I love their style and I love his, I, I don't even know how you explain his, he was just dynamic and yeah. uh, he just kind of could t- take a game, kind of like Dane Coles does now. He was probably the older version of Dane Coles, looking back on it, um, and just great leaders and good people. Um, yeah. And, yeah, um, always kind of dream, oh, if I could play like them, that would be next level. But I was, I, my problem was I was slow compared to them. I didn't have that, that X Factor zip that they have. Um, even though I tried, I just I didn't have that same zip. So yeah. I probably was a bit more of a traditional hooker, but still still loved their style. Yeah. Mm. Oh, Brian Moore didn't get a look in, did he not? No, <laughs> unfortunately. It's, it's, it's hard here, though, because eh? obviously with Six Nations and all that stuff, it's just different times. So yeah. um, unless you're really watching it and trying to find it, it's quite hard to see a lot of the games, um, unless you want to get up in the middle of the night. And... So back to personal training, Jay, what's your sort of philosophy with, with clients and in the health and wellness game? What, what's your sort of approach to training? And um, can you describe any 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 breakthroughs you've had with any clients in the last six or 12 months and what were the keys to the breakthroughs would you say yeah it's interesting so i'll probably change a little bit when i was younger i did a lot of i helped out a lot of people and did some personal training while i was training to be a rugby player but as you learn you learn experience along the way and probably like we've talked about lots is um your body will only take you so far if your mind's not ready to go there so um the breakthroughs i have is trying to unpack so I always talk about, it's the inner critic stuff. So um, what are you saying in your mind? What are, the, what are the triggers that are saying, I'm not good enough at this? Why can't you do this? It's too hard. And kind of unpacking that and saying, well, actually, you can do this. Um, you have the ability. And this is the growth mindset, fixed mindset stuff that we talk a little bit about, which is the positive psychology stuff, which is what I love. So um, even though I'm training you, I'm actually trying to get a bit more understanding around What's, what's hanging you up? What's holding you back from going to where you want to go? Um, and even if you feel like you're good, why can't we go to that next level and unpacking those situations? Because to me personally, um, the training part's actually the easy part. Writing you a program and saying, this is what you're going to do is actually the easy part, I reckon. It's um, unpacking what's holding you back, what's going on in the mind, what can we do with those things to take you to the next level. And um, I don't know if it's a success, but I'm working with a lady at the moment who um, wants to have a baby. So she's trying to get healthy enough to have a baby, but she's got a lot of unpacking, a lot of stuff going on that's making that hard for her. Um, so we're, we're really trying to work on those things. And I think when we get to unpack some of that stuff, the exercise will be the easy part. And we haven't got there yet. And it's a challenge for me. So success stories, um, I think for me, the success I have is, people building awareness around what their mind's saying and, and what's holding them back in that, in that environment. Um, and that can be purely even in a session when it's really, really hard. Are you getting consumed by that hardness and just going, oh, this is so hard, I can't do this anymore? Or are you going, actually, my body loves this. This is where my body needs to be to get better and embracing that. And just by one situation changing how you, how you kind of develop or what you say in your mind in that one situation will either make you stop or will let you continue. And that's not being fitter or that's just effectively changing how you, what you're saying in your mind. Um, so I don't know if that really answers your question, but that's probably where I'm going more with my personal training. Yeah. 
I mean, with the old pain, the, the, the whole concept of pain, I, I seem to remember the Matrix quote, you know, pain is just, you know, a bunch of receptacles in the brain. So mm -hmm. would you say if I came to you and says, I want to be, I want to boost my health and wellness, my physical strength, but I don't want any pain. What, what, can people genuinely progress and avoid pain, do you think, in the game? Um, what I say to most, or what I'd say to most people, let's just get started. Mm. And what you find with most is they might start that way, but if they get into it and we get past that, yeah. then they want to start pushing. So they see value in, you know, there's a lot of value in just building up, getting used to coming to the gym three to four times a week and building that routine. No question. That's a big start of people at the start. But once they get past that, then they want more. They want more. And then um, that door starts opening up for a little bit more pain and changing up what we're doing. And then you find that that door opens and then eventually they go, oh, actually, I've come a long way from that start when I didn't want to do that. Um, and that's probably the cookies in the cookie jar. Um, um, sorry. Um, right. so, uh, yeah, so, yeah, it's kind of like the Andy Bell cookies in a cookie jar. So keep putting little things in that cookie jar and build it up. And then over time, that becomes something you can look back on and say, actually, I've done quite a lot here. Um, that cookie jar's full and let's make it bigger and better. Mm. The old motivation is fascinating, isn't it? The old intrinsic, extrinsic motivation and coming um, to train with you in a group environment for me has been a big lift from where I was prior. So it, when, it look, when you look at motivation, Jed, someone's at home, they might, maybe they're a clan or they've done really well, but they're at home and you know they've done next to nothing in lockdown. How, how do you pierce that and reinvigorate that in a sense of motivation? Any tips or strategies there? Yeah, so first thing, as I say to them, is stop being hard on yourself. Because what you find with most of them is, um, even though they're not training, they're just ripping themselves. They're going, ah, oh, I'm so average, I should have done this, I'm not doing it. And you, they're kind of just, they're living in that negative feedback cycle. So they're, and I'm not there to break you and say, oh, you're terrible, you haven't done this. I'm there to kind of be beside you and say, hey, okay, that's fine that's happened, what have we learned from what's happened in those last couple of weeks? So, yep, so these obstacles came in or challenges came. So what are them? What, what can we put in place to try and help those not be, not affect you from now on? And let's start a new plan. So what do we start from tomorrow? All right, so our goal is let's get back to three times a week, start off real basic like we did when we get the first person in, and let's get you back into some sort of routine and we'll build up from there. And if you miss a day, no sweat, let's start again the next day. And that's me just checking in with them, helping building that plan um, and building them back up to where they were. And what you find is um, people having two weeks off isn't actually that big of a deal. But to them in their mind, it's, it's huge. And they've made it a massive mountain. But I think it's, it's something like 14 days before you actually start losing any cardiovascular fitness and muscular fitness before you, you know, before that trend happens anyway. And generally after two weeks back, you've got that back. Um, so it's actually not as big as big of a deal as people think. Yeah. Um, you might be sore for a couple of days, but you actually can get back on that, back on that run pretty quick. So yeah, probably don't worry. It's okay. No stress. We all have these times. Let's yeah. start again, build a plan and let's go from here and, and don't worry about it too much. Yeah. Um, that's probably how I'd start. It's so psychological. I know, I know myself, if I don't go, as you, you're absolutely right, your little train of negativity. And, but cardiovascularly, muscle mass wise, you're probably you know, 98% or what have you. Um, but it's just that inner mind game, isn't it? Oh, definitely. Like, and I, and like if you look at me, if I didn't exercise four days, I'd go look in the mirror and go, oh, I look smaller. Or I look. But actually, if you took yeah. a photo of me four days ago, I probably don't look any different. Because I've told my mind it is, I look in and I'm like, oh, yeah. oh my God, that's starting to look a bit bigger. And, I, and you start just, you just live into that inner critic and all that negative bias around what you're saying. Yeah. But actually, if, if I took a picture and you know, send it to you, you'd be like, gee, you don't look any different. But from the outside, that's easy. But from the inside, it's, it's so much harder. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's probably the thing that I'm here to help you, not to, not to berate you and say, hey, come on. Yeah. Yeah. So, Jed, with the health and wellness and the, the COVID crisis, and obviously the NZ situation and mental health and you know suicide, etc. Uh, I've been asking other interviews if they had a minute with Jacinda about you know what would they like to see you know maybe flourish and grow more so mm. in NZ around health, well-being, fitness mm. as a silver lining coming out of COVID. What 
if you had a, if you had a minute to chat to Jacinda, what would you like to see more of in NZ or in this space of health and wellness? Yeah, it's interesting. So I probably I probably steal a bit of Seligman's work. Um, so he's put together. He did a thing for the American Army. So what he um, what he wanted to do, the American Army were going, hey, we've got all these people that are committing suicide and getting PTSD, so post traumatic syndrome disorder from from going to war. Um, can you help us? And he said, yep. Let's give me them before they go to war. So he basically put a he got put them through a profile that they did, um, which is around that perma model that we talked about before. Took them through that, and then what their answers was, depending what their strong points were and their weak weak points were within those five categories, sent them to do some training in those areas. Yeah. And he's dropped PTSD and suicide by fifty percent in the American Army by giving them the tools before they got into a stressful environment. Um, now, there's been a few countries that have um, taken it on as a whole country and become the positive psychology country. So if I had a minute with Jacinda, I would say, please, can we put in some strategies to help people before they, get, before they feel average or before they start getting depressed or being anxious? That gives them the tools so when they get there, they've got the ability to handle it. And that's probably... <laughs> In schools, it's in some schools already in environments where we can learn learn more about this and become just part of how we teach people to live, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, well, fascinating. Um, yeah, just to see the future of, of this in NZ, and I, you know, I do hope some great things come out of this, you mm -hmm. know, sense of uh, you know, behaviors and disciplines of, of us to, to train and to take our, our wellness that much more seriously. Um, just looking at your back back to your rugby career, who, in sense of the, the the training and the the technical side of that, who who was most influential for you throughout your rugby career? Um, so it's interesting. So in terms of yeah, it's you have a lot of influential people within rugby, um, and then you have you got your medical staff. So um, your medical, and we always joked about this, but your physio was kind of your he was your psychologist your um he, he was the one that obviously fixed your injuries he was the one that gave you confidence and looking back there's probably each team i've been in and there's been a couple of physios in particular that um were more than just physios um they're not just treating your injury but they're treating to make sure that you're ready in your mind to go back but then they're the ones when you're lying on the bench you're telling them that you're having a tough day because your girlfriend's um, you yeah, done this to you or yeah. um, you're stressed because you've got uni to do and they become kind of your linchpin of the team and the funny thing about a physio is in, in sport and in rugby in general they're the pretty much the lowest paid and the last one on the roster but they're the most important because I could play a game of rugby without a coach because I could coach myself I could play a game of rugby without a trainer because I could train myself but if I got injured, I couldn't, if I, I don't know what an injury is and I, and I need a trainer and I need a physio to help give me recovery and, and to give me all the tools to get better. Yeah. But in terms of rugby, they're almost the, the last one on the list to be picked. Mm -hmm. But from my point of view, the physio is almost the most important in a whole rugby environment. Wow, that's fascinating, yeah. Yeah, um, and if you ask any physio, they, they hear a lot more than anyone else does. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming coaches know that now, so I'm assuming they go to the physios to find out what's actually really going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. So again, I don't know if that answers your question, but um, yeah, definitely a, a certain physio called Terry Stone, who I grew up with, um, and he he was one of uh, one of the older physios when we were growing up in the academy system when we were young again when it was quite influential. Um, had a huge impact on helping me through that period when I was probably low in confidence and. Um, just trying to learn my game a little bit and was finding things quite tough in that environment. Yeah. Um, kind of probably put his arm around me a little bit and said, it's okay, you're working hard, you can do this yeah. um, when I needed it. I was just interviewing some other personal trainers at, who come from maybe a holistic sort of background. Mm. And um, what's your take on the, you know, the mind, body, body, spirit, the sort of holistic view to, to wellness? What's your take on that? Yeah, it's interesting. Again, Growing up, I, I probably didn't think too much about the the spiritual and, and stuff. Um, 
there is no question that the body is in, interconnected. Mm -hmm. So, as I said before, is none of this stuff works by itself out. So the body doesn't do one thing, the mind doesn't do one thing, and the spirit doesn't do one thing. They are all connected. Mm -hmm. So even though I probably um, don't call it a holistic approach personally, there is no question that if you can work on all of those areas, they help each other out, and that's a major part of feeling better and flourishing like we talked about. Yeah. And do you, do you adopt any, any mindset tools or rituals, Jed, for like meditation, or do you yeah, practice, yeah. Do you, do you practice um, yourself? Yeah, so main, again, I don't know if I call it meditation, I do a lot of breathing techniques. So, um, and really, it's just if I'm starting to feel um, like if I get quite angry, like starting to get grumpy with the kids or over, um, yeah, just I can get quite, um, I have quite a high anxiety arousal. So I can get quite, um, got a lot of testosterone in terms of I can get quite fired up quite quickly, but also I can be. So that chemical balance for me is that's where exercise comes in and kind of levels me out a bit. Um, so yeah, breathing techniques is probably the big one for me. So um, literally just 10 deep breaths. Um, we try it with the kids with rocket breaths, but they always tell me to go away. Um, so yeah, so just deep breathing really. So big deep breaths. And then with that, and this is the hardest part is when I'm doing that to actually just think about breathing in and out. So, um, and that's around the, mindfulness stuff so actually trying to not keep the brain just keep thinking about if i'm worried about something or keep thinking just going okay big deep breath in big deep breath out and do that 10 or 12 times yep. until i'm not thinking about anything apart from my breathing yep. um and that, those will be probably just the little short things i do um i've probably done less of this lately but when i was playing rugby i had a lot of positive affirmations mm -hmm. um so when i started to get anxious and negative thoughts um I had one basically thing I said to myself was faith or fear, Jed. So mm -hmm. have faith in what you've done, faith that you're okay, um, if, and choose faith over the fear. So the fear of being anxious about making a mistake or going to this new team and worried about um, what it's going to be like or just have faith that you'll be okay and, and kind of use my breathing. And those are probably the two things that I've done in most of my career. Um, and then when I was playing, I did a lot of imagery so a lot of visualization um visualization visualization or imagery is brilliant and um, what people don't really know about imagery is your brain can't decipher between real and perceptual stimuli so if you're doing imagery so in, a, in a terms of rugby if i'm closing my mind and i'm throwing a rugby ball in and i can see it released from my hand with a beautiful spiral and someone's catching it my brain's actually learning that just as much as me actually doing that physically yeah. so um so there's, so imagery is great because I actually don't need to do anything in terms of just close my eyes and really dive into what I'm doing. Um, and I'm getting the same effect as actually as training. Yeah. So um, imagery was hu huge for me when I was, again, feeling anxious or um, going into a game or maybe I missed three or four line outs the game before and I was worried about that going into it. I'd close my eyes and watch myself do that throw a hundred times with a perfect spiral and hit it. And actually, I found when I came out of that, I was a lot less anxious because I'd just done it a hundred times. Yeah. Um, and then I and I kind of just use that whenever I was going anxious, I go back to that positive affirmation, the breathing, and then to the imagery. And mm -hmm. that was kind of the loop that I used to help me. Um, but again, that took me probably seven or eight years of playing to learn that. Mm -hmm. um, at the start, I was very, very anxious and worried going into a game. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, just by practice and experience, I kind of learned those things. Yeah, fantastic. Mm. What would you say is your essence to in your approach to nutrition, Jed? Yeah, again, so um, my one is probably I'm more of a balanced approach. So because um, of the way I grew up with nutrition, especially in a rugby environment, it's you need to eat a lot. Um, and there's obviously heaps of stuff around keto and um, intermittent fasting, and I've tried all of them. Um, what I've kind of fallen back on is – you have protein and carbs together and you, as long as you're mixing and you're generally having good food, so um, not high in salt or high in fat or anything, just good balanced food with a lot of vegetables, I'm okay. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't mean that works for everybody. Um, what I found that works for me is um, that works for me the best 
um, it's the easiest to follow and I can see that sustaining that for a long period of time. Where I find the other diets um, or life ways of eating, I couldn't sustain it for a long period of time. And so I ended up in that yo-yo form. Um, but not to say that's for everyone. It's, nutrition's a really hard one for me. It's really personal and really individual. Um, so um, it's great to try things and experience it because you just develop range and you, you find out what works for you. But again, it definitely comes down to your experiences and, and talking to, for me, I, I don't feel, um, I'm not an expert enough to give enough on this personally. Um, I find that I generally send this on to nutritionists to say, hey, this is what I'm working with. This is what I've tried, some balanced seeding around how much sugar, how much fat, how much salt, but it's not working for them. Can you give me some help? It's probably the one area that I don't feel confident enough to give a lot of information on, but have found over time it is de definitely a lot more individual than I realized. Instead of just saying, hey, here's, here's the system, go for it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. It seems to be a lot of attention on sleep today. It mm. seems to be the, the new currency of thinking. And one of my prior interviewees, Michael Hempsey, talked about, mm. and I think Ariana Huffington's written about sleep as the new currency. It's almost as important as food. Mm. Have you got an angle on, on sleep or the importance of that for your clients mm. or your health and wellness? No, I would agree. So everyone talks about, like, obviously for, for exercise, we always talk about recovery. So um, there's everything from... Um, you know, like skins was the big thing for a while there. Everyone had to wear skins for recovery. And then from my age, we, we list, you know, the hot colds, so there's a cold water immersion. Yeah. Uh, then, it's, you know, like just have your legs up in the air. Um, but as we all know, the number one thing for recovery, for letting your body adapt, and, and that's brain and body, is sleep. Um, now, for some of us who have young kids, um, that isn't our choice, which is hard. Yeah. Uh, which is hard, we don't, you know, like if we have kids, we don't have the choice to sleep eight hours in a row. Um, but I know for myself, that means I just need to go to bed earlier. So I might have a broken sleep, but instead of me sitting there and, and playing on the computer and watching YouTube clips till 10.30, that means I need to go to bed by 9.30 and actually structure that into my, into my day. Mm. And when I find that I start feeling less well or not as happy as when I've started pushing those hours out, and I go, hey, Jed, you need to come back to that 9.30 sleep time and get some more sleep and get back into that routine. Yeah. Um, so I would agree that sleep, nutrition, and exercise are, are all as equal, as important as each other. Mm. Yeah. Hey, Jed, thanks so much for your time today. I know time's precious, and uh, it's been great to have you on this short interview. Really appreciate it. And I think we're all hanging out for the for that gym to get back open, aren't we? <laughs> Yeah, you just the the old. It's funny. I call it the old normality now. Like yeah, to the old normal. Yeah, it's like the new norm. Um, yeah, just um, human connections crucial for me. Eh, just having like it's great to talk like this, but to actually do it a meter away from each other and have a yarn and, and get a session and, and just spend some time with people is probably what I'm craving the most. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So just finally, Jed, where can we find you? This uh, if folk are watching this short interview and they want to connect with you, Jed, how, how do they find you? Oh, that's a good point. Um, so obviously, if, if you want to feed, you go to Fed by Jed, uh, fedbyjed.com if you want to feed. So I've got a wood pipe <laughs> there. Um, if you want to obviously get into personal training, then Koha Fitness is where I'm based out of, which obviously where you chase train, Chris. So probably going to the Koha website and going that way is probably the best way to find me. Um, yeah, and then obviously, yeah, that, yeah, those are probably the two best ways to find me if, if you want to get in touch and have a yarn or look at some mindset stuff or do some training or yeah and just a final question i know we're talking before we went on about doing a drug-free work with the rugby community mm. i mean that sounds as if potentially that that could spill out to to, to other communities in nz because obviously drug use is a real challenge eh? yeah it's, it's interesting so obviously the drug-free sport one is based around um keeping sport drug-free or keeping people away from it but it's a lot of the same mindset and value system that goes into why people cheat in sport is similar to the, no, the normal population. Um, and that has been discussed about how this education can be moved out into the population. Um, it's funded under the sporting government at the moment. So um, again, it's probably another, another good chat with Jacinda around um, how can we get this into the into the real world more and, and help people that, and around their value system and what they see as 
good and bad and that type of thing. So, um, but it's it's been great to help, um, especially the young players come through, mm. just teaching them around their value system and, and what do they want to be known for in sport. Yeah, um, it's a it's a cool thing to be doing. Yeah, we'll have to get Jacinda on the next one, won't we? Give it a crack, mate. Give it a crack. <laughs> hey, thanks again, Jed. Cool. We'll, awesome. we'll catch you soon. Thanks, Chris. Cheers, mate. All right. See you later.